This time around, we are discussing the Ashy Slashy, a soul-sucking good time. Head to your local library to broaden your horizons and summon legions of the undead. Mental asylums are mandatory. The original Cabin in the Woods. They say laughter is the best medicine. But what if the disease is laughing back at you? Let's go space trucking. Hey, bro, you got the whole room laughing. A mixture of horniness and getting high is eventually what led to the apocalypse. They're not zombies, they're deadites. A demon in human skin, get your boomstick and chainsaw ready because this time around, we are telling you why you wouldn't survive Evil Dead's Deadeye Invasion. Now today, we will be covering lore, points, and the story in the original trilogy consisting of Evil Dead 1 and 2, Army of Darkness, and its continuation series, Ash vs. Evil Dead. We will not be discussing the Evil Dead 2013 reboot, the spin-off video games, nor the comics and their litany of crossover events and alternate timelines. So, no Marvel Zombies, Female Ash, Vampires, or HP Lovecraft. Sorry to disappoint. Long ago, before the Age of Man, in another realm outside the universe and realm of our current reality, existed a small race of beings called the Dark Ones. These creatures that vary in shapes and sizes reminiscent of what closely resembles depictions of demons. Holding unimaginable manipulative and mental powers, they eventually broke the containment of their original universe and bled into that of our own during the primitive age of man. Upon their arrival, the Dark Ones immediately saw to the enslavement of all mankind, doing so by using the undead spirits of the Deadites, entities capable of possessing the bodies of any living or dead thing, and becoming an indomitable threat even current man has a near impossible time of defeating. Because of the Dark Ones and their use of the Deadites, humanity would know no other kind of existence without kneeling before the evil dead. Through numerous methods across multiverses, the Dark Ones would eventually be banished to another realm known as the Mirror Dimension along with these Deadites so that mankind could flourish and prosper on Earth for millennia. Despite these beings being confined to another reality, their influence would still have long-reaching and lasting effects at the development of man. Their manipulative presence being felt numerous times in our world's history, causing the Black Death and even with implications stating that the Dark Ones influenced infamous figures like Adolf Hitler with these manipulated individuals seeking out artifacts across the world that could one day fully bring back the Dark Ones and usher in another age of their rule. The Dark Ones pre-banishment had created an untold number of books, the covers made from skin, the pages made from flesh, and the scripture written in Sumerian of the blood of men and women called the Necronomicon Ex Mortis. Within what are at least three of these volumes lies prophecies, incantations to summon the dead, and passages to resurrect powerful demons. One of these Necronomicons was displaced into a graveyard in 14th century England during the reign of Lord Arthur at Castle Kendar, where an army of darkness of skeletons, corpses, and even demons was created and fought against a medieval army led by a time-traveling badass known as the Hero from the Sky. The book and its hellish powers would be sealed away and would remain untouched until it would be rediscovered in the early 1980s by an American research team led by one Professor Raymond Noby alongside an intricately designed dagger. He would bring this book and blade back to a cabin he owned with his wife in the woods of Michigan. From there, the good doctor would decipher the text of this horrific looking book, reading out its passages and recording them as he delved more and more, unknowingly summoning the trigger for what would become a recurring nightmare in our world frequently until society would be led to its eventual destruction as Ash fought back against them, living, dying, losing, winning, heading to the past, coming back to the future, getting handy, going insane, killing, laughing, killing some more, watching some people switch teams to the dead outside faster than the internet changes their opinions about internet personalities and dealing with Monty Python and Mad Max levels of zombie <clears throat> deadite invasions. Now, there is plenty more in terms of lore and chronically the adventures and escapades of Ashley J. Williams, the prophesied warrior and soul hero that could defeat this uprising of the evil dead. 
But what if Ashley either didn't exist or was killed prematurely before any of his prophesied accomplishments could occur? What would happen if someone were to stumble upon, translate, and intentionally or accidentally evoke the powers of the Necronomicon Ex Mortis? Whether or not someone who discovered the book knows its intentions or not, any human stumbling upon and using this text will have no way of using its powers to their evil advantage. Instead, they are basically cracking the dam open while standing in front of it, waiting for the torrential flood to carry them away. And as this professor says, The book itself is harmless, unless wielded by someone either very evil or very stupid. And don't we all know a majority of us and mankind falls in either one or both of these categories. Upon reciting from these texts, a supernatural groaning force will be summoned known as the Kandarian Demon, an almost ethereal entity flying about as a non-physical mist that flies around our plane at high speeds, winding around obstacles like forests and townships, giving out a chilling otherworldly moan as it makes its way to a predetermined target, often crashing through surfaces to knock down anything that may get in its way, even sending moving vehicles flying and destroying hardened structures. While it has no physical form, some might say it's just an unstoppable force of nature, as the film's portrayal of it in the original trilogy is nothing more than the vision of the Kandarian spirit, and eventually in the TV series as a merely fastly looming fog, as it wanders violently. Ashley J. Williams even describes it as a dark and shapeless thing that lives not in the spaces that we know, but between them in the dark. As it approaches its target, the entity can manipulate electronics, either causing them to fluctuate or overload, and shut off while causing physical objects like glass, knives, or anything else to float, rattle, or be thrown with enough force to instantly kill bystanders. The only way of stopping its relentless pursuit is by getting behind a strong enough wall or getting to an area of holy grounds where it will thereby be repelled. If this is not achievable, and then when it reaches a person, animal, or even an object, it can infect them and transform them into to a Deadeye instantaneously. While some may say these new reformed corpses of their former selves can be labeled as a zombie, that is way too far from the truth. A Deadeye is much more than just a brain-dead walking corpse. No, think of these reanimated dead as more of a malleable clay that can become anything its dark master wishes, while also possessing intellect, cunning, and a way more brutally mischievous and violent nature. They can walk like regular people, talk like regular people, but will kill better than the average person. The means of infection and possession can be fast and sometimes unnoticeable by multiple means, ranging from the standard bite or scratch by an infected, causing the sort of bile-like darkness to course through your veins from its point of entry until your body fully succumbs to the infection. But Unlike any other zombie apocalypse, a bite or scratch isn't the limit of being forcefully indoctrinated into the army of darkness. As merely being killed in any way by any deadite, the Kandarian demon, or the dark ones can have you converting to their side. If someone with the Necronomicon chanted a few certain spells, then possession of themselves or basically anyone nearby will also become instantaneous. Hell, the demon and the book don't even need a living host in order to create a Deadeye. If they can find a dead body, they will use it to create an undead soldier, ranging from the freshly deceased, a rotting corpse, or even just a pure skeleton, showing that the more the death count against this threat becomes, the more Deadites that they can create and use in the process. Basically meaning, no matter how hard you try, you will not be able to stop yourself from turning. Even the titular hero, Ash, has become a Deadite more than a few times. But unlike Ash and his prophecy plot hero convenient armor, you, on the other hand, won't have holy spirits or plot conveniences to turn you back to normal. No, this is real life now, baby, especially with the Kandarian demon roaming around instantly converting people in any situation.
Now, what about the Deadites themselves once they have been created? What exactly makes them such a threat beyond their means of infection? Well, their insane levels of durability, strength, and dexterity are also a huge factor into your non-survival. Their muscle mass will internally increase enough to where they can throw humans of any shape and size long distances and easily fling large objects like furniture and rip doors off cars as if they weighed nothing at all. They can also move at such high speeds that they can almost seem invisible to the naked eye, dodging any opposing gunfire and catching up to anyone attempting to escape them, even by vehicle. No matter who the person is, even if they're a small granny or even a toddler, will suddenly have these powers and capabilities, even being able to levitate themselves to higher areas or avoid gunfire. Unlike normal zombies, they have a high level of intellect and will see to using any weapon they can find, like chainsaws, machetes, or even shards of glass, or even their newly developed elongated claws or jagged, rotting, sharpened teeth to tear open and eviscerate their victims. Even enough to use them as puppets, they will use their hands to literally use your body as a puppet. They also have the ability to shapeshift their form in order to gain the upper hand in just about any direct encounter, giving themselves adhesive palms and feet in order to cling to walls and vertical surfaces, being able to manipulate the head as if you were possessed by the exorcist, grow giant bat-like wings in order to fly around landscapes and high speeds and swoop down on prey, extending their neck out and disfiguring their face to become a horrific sight capable of easily reaching and biting into their victims, grabbing living survivors and slowly melting and fusing their flesh into their own to become a multi-bodied hybrid or thicken their body mass with fat and bile so that even chainsaws and the sharpest of weapons will have a hell of a time cutting through them. Hell, even toddlers, grannies, and babies can be killing machines with disgusting abilities. As we saw with the child of a dark one being able to crawl inside the dead body of a woman and pilot it to fight enemies in a very childish way. These shape-shifting powers can also be used in conjunction with the retained memories and personality traits of the person they have taken control of, morphing their face to look feel and act like the person's former living self and using this facade to deceive others and lure them into a false sense of security or make them believe the possession has ended only to kill them with their pants down or drive them deeper into insanity not knowing what to believe is real fake good or evil. Anyone you know at any given time could be a deadite in disguise, waiting for their opportunity to strike. Also keep in mind, the more intellectual and stronger a person is before turning, the more that the deadites can use them to their advantage. With the greater spread of the deadites comes a sense of unity in their ranks, since they possess a veritable hive mind intelligence, as they often refer to their individual selves as us and we, allowing them to gather more intel from any minds they envelop and learn from their mistakes and losses each time one deadite is killed, learning more and more what strengths and weaknesses current humanity holds. If you are able to discern any enemy or fight one in their demonic state, well, landing a blow on these demonic denizens probably won't do too much in the way of slowing them down, immobilizing them, or outright killing them. They can withstand numerous gunshots, blows to the head, and even being completely burned alive, with even a cremated body skeleton still managing to resurrect and attack the living. The only real way of killing a deadite is by dismembering all four limbs from their body, but more importantly, destroying or removing the head, the only real reminiscent attribute of the zombie archetype. However, even decapitation in a few instances hasn't outright killed a few deadites, with them still being able to control the body their head was severed from in order to kill a target. And even the head itself is still able to bite and infect anyone that draws near enough in order to spread the infection further. A reason why Ash Williams, after being bitten by his decapitated girlfriend, Linda was forced to cut off his right hand after he lost control of it to the deadite infection before it spread throughout the rest of his body. So yeah, even parts of your own body, once infected, will attempt to kill you by grabbing any bladed weapons nearby to force you into involuntary suicide. Attacking your converted body part will still cause you immense pain. 
So attempting to sever this deadite limb of yours will require an immeasurable pain tolerance. But even from there, your fight would not be over, as the severed body part, like a hand, will become its own moving entity and deadite, scurrying around, trying to devise ways for your way to demise. While the thought of just a hand, leg, arm, or foot trying to kill you doesn't sound too intimidating, well, these severed limbs can choose to grow an exact replica of you, and from there, will just be another deadite looking to kill you and possibly further deceive others as your persona. In a few instances, a person possessed by a deadite can regain control of their body and mind if a lover or deeply connected family member were to break through this dark control by giving the victim an overwhelming sense of grief or reminding them of who they once were. However, in most cases, deadites, if not acting too cocky or playing with their food for too long, can see to killing anyone their possessed body has any emotional connection to before that can happen. In the early stages of the deadite's first outbreak, sunlight can also be a deterring factor to them, forcing them to operate in the dark. But deadites were quickly shown to easily function in broad daylight without any interference pretty early on. So it comes down to you being able to absolutely mutilate your friends and family to prevent yourself from becoming a vessel used by the dark ones. And depending on how widespread the deadites have expanded their influence could mean outside interference from living humans. For you see, being caught covered in blood with dismembered bodies and possibly a deadite reverting their appearance to appear frightened at your recent horrific actions could see you at the bullet end of armed responses by police or firearm wielding civilians. Who is going to believe that the crying girl in the corner of the room where you were forced to kill countless others is a zombie that you were defending yourself against? No one's going to believe you after you just massacred an entire group. Trying to oust what the deadites are and what their probable danger to mankind is will just have you be seen as an insane person who will either be killed or permanently incarcerated. So they can use their shape-shifting to look innocent to put you in a situation where you're either going to die or you're going to be incapacitated and can do nothing about the spread of the deadites. Whether it be a solitary incident or a widespread doomsday event, the spread of the deadites is nearly unstoppable in their high minded but discreet attack on the wider population. They can also possess inanimate objects like toys, trees, knickknacks on your walls, basically anything you can set your eyes on, converting their mass to a more bloodied and human-like organic form in order to either further distract you, send you on your way to insanity, or kill and turn any nearby survivors. Toys and puppets suddenly springing to life to gouge out your throat, or gigantic trees and fauna using their branches and roots to bind you and easily choke you out and rip you apart in order to make further deadite soldiers. Anything around you could be a newly formed deadite. But the deadites are not the only threat when the dark ones come looking in our reality. Merely having your physical body killed isn't the death of your torment because, as we discussed earlier, there is a way of you coming back to your body. When you are killed by a deadite, as they chant that they will swallow your soul, your soul will be sent somewhere known as the Mirror Dimension. A dimension nearly identical to ours, but with a more ominous aura, as other newly murdered survivors around you will frantically search for a way out. In this dimension, a shadowy mass will be lurking around for any lost souls and, if found, will pull them into a black hole with dozens of dead hands reaching out from it to pull you in, never to be seen again. So when you are killed, your soul will enter a veritable purgatory that looks just like the location of where you just perished, but each and every door is locked tight to prevent your escape as you try to find safety slowly losing your sanity as this dark figure sleuths you out, only to eventually have your very soul eradicated and cascaded into a dark void. There is no way of escaping this dimension once you are there, except by the methods of the Dark Ones and those who have cooperatively worked with them. 
Through the use of the Necronomicon Ex Mortis, many, many more deadly and destructive forces like demons can be reckoned with going forward as well, as seen with the demon of the mind, Elagos. In its somewhat physical form, it can fade in and out of reality in blinks in order to drop in on a victim to knock them around with great force. Its most terrifying abilities, though, are ones of psychokinesis, allowing it to levitate and throw projectiles at high speed even glass shards to impale and kill victims from afar. Its mental powers also allow it to burst synapses in one's mind in order to control them, making their victims believe they are attacking the demon when in actuality they are assaulting their own allies, basically turning you against others making you believe you're fighting evil. Elagos also has enough strength as any deadite to send human beings flying with one swing of its arm. It can also possess people, much like a deadite, to use their bodies as Trojan horses. Only through sanctimonious means can it be ejected through a body, and when it does, it will leave the body by physically leaving through any orifice, where then it can attack and kill as it pleases. Now it can be killed by regular gunfire. Pinning it down though before it blows your mind or annihilates you will probably have you a bloody pulp before that can even happen. Another demon by the name of Baal, an immortal human-like being capable of telepathy he uses to manipulate others to perceive what he wishes you to see, think, believe that is real, causing people to turn on others, effectively controlling their minds. Now, unlike his predecessor Elagos, Baal wields a razor-sharp claw that he uses to skin people alive, and from there can enter these new skin suits to masquerade as that person. There is a lot of deceit in becoming an imposter, that's pretty sus bro, amongst these evil dudes and dudettes. Baal, however, is unkillable by any human methods and can only be vanquished by use of the Necronomicon. But Elagos and Baal are only two demons of what we know out of an untold many that the Necronomicon can summon at any time. There's no telling how many or what kind of demons can be drawn to our world by its blood-written pages and what their capabilities might be to kill us. Now, the original writer and creator of the book, known as Ruby Nobi, being an actual dark one that defected from this evil group in order to gain the Necronomicon's power for itself. While wielding it, she is, in of herself, immortal. She can use any incantation and spell she wishes from the Necronomicon as its creator and can use any demon or deadite as her tools. While she detests violence in any way, her methods usually end up with you and your friends as corpses to meet her goals. If any humans, like Ash, do rise up to rival the destiny of the book's nature, Ruby can see to using that hero's DNA to create her own hellspawn of a child that will develop to the hero's age and physique in just a few days. Yes, that's right, if there's any human capable of fighting back, she can make an exact duplicate of that person down to every strength and weakness they have. There is only one weapon that can cause notable pain and even moderate to severe death death to her, Ball, and the legions of Deadite plaguing our world. A small blade called the Kandarian Dagger, made from the bones of man. Through untold magical power, this dagger can effectively injure and kill any evil power, causing their flesh to burn and create injuries that are either uncurable or take higher powers like Ball and Ruby longer to regenerate from. It is the only known weapon in existence to have any kind of chance of fighting back with once anything stronger than a deadite enters our world. When it comes to a resistance of any kind, only one order of humans that knows the weaknesses and truly how to defeat this evil go by the name of the Knights of Sumeria, a society that has been passed down since the 14th century, although they hold the knowledge of the Dark Ones and their capabilities, they too are only human, and are easily snuffed out when in combat with even regular Deadites. So even having the knowledge of the Necronomicon, the Deadites, and the Dark Ones isn't enough for the society that has been preparing for centuries. Most terrifying of all are the cause of the evil dead, the Dark Ones. 
human-like cloaked beings that want nothing more than to reclaim the world they were banished from. Once the Necronomicon has been used, over time during the chaos it creates, the seal keeping the Dark Ones in their dimension will fade more and more until they are able to return to our dimension. Upon their arrival, they will seek out the book and any missing pages that may have been torn from it. They too are immortal like Ruby, but possess more darkened power. Any living or dead thing that draws near it can be grabbed by the Dark Ones and have their soul hastily sucked out and destroyed by their own breath. If a Deadite or Dark One defects from the Army of Darkness and wishes to aid humanity in their fight, the Dark Ones will not hesitate in simply procuring them and taking their body and soul and scorching it in hellfire until nothing is left but charred remains. In their existence, nothing but a memory in any world. That's right, these unkillable entities like Ruby, if they decide to side with us and try to fight the Dark Ones, will simply be exterminated in seconds. While we try to stop them in their book hunt, nothing will work as they wipe out any adversaries. No gun, no type of fire, nothing on this planet can destroy them. Once the fully intact book has been claimed, they will vanish into the darkness of our world as the entire planet grows darker, storms rising everywhere, and a heavy rain descends upon us with a gigantic shadow rising from beneath the Earth's crust. Last of what we can discern before being wiped out as a species is Kandar the Destroyer, a demon reminiscent of something a 1980s metal band would have on their album covers. Fuck. Standing thousands of feet tall, this terrifying monster will begin his process of human extinction, blowing extreme amounts of fire across the land, pretty much napalming anything it sets its sights on, even being able to destroy fighter pilots in moments. Full military response would come to combat this hell kaiju, but would be nothing more than an exploitable advantage in its eyes. For you see, any damage that Kandar the Destroyer takes, whether it be from ballistic gunfire, explosives, or even nuclear strikes would only empower it and cause it to grow larger. And considering how destructive it is, quick and reckless attacks on it by armed forces would be humanity's only response, empowering our greatest enemy so that it may wipe out our greatest weapons and crippling our species to welcome our new masters. Kandar the Destroyer only has one weakness, being the Kandarian Dagger, that tiny ass blade. With Kandar the Destroyer only being able to be harmed by it with Ash firing it from a tank. But a scenario like that playing out is hard to see to come to reality for us. I don't think anybody's gonna be shooting a dagger out of a tank in these scenarios. We're just gonna be relying on good old fashioned military might, especially since the Dark Ones would probably procure this weapon so that it may never be used to challenge their rule. They would take the dagger and make sure humans will never be able to use it. So at the end of the day, the Medal of Man will be tested thoroughly, and I'm pretty sure we will fail. So if you find yourself in a situation where the Necronomicon is being used, there will not be any escape from what comes next. The Kandarian Demon's ethereal assault at high speeds that will instantly possess you and turn you into a Deadite, killing you in the process. Any living, dead, or inanimate thing near you being free real estate to become a Deadite, looking to either kill you outright or play with you and watch you slowly lose your mind before ending your life. You have to avoid being bitten or scratched by a Deadite to prevent an infection that will either take hold of you or have your own body trying to kill you, unless you have the balls to cut off parts of your own body to survive. Fighting back with whatever weapons you may have, no matter how armed you are, from guns to melee weapons to your good old fashioned fists, will be nothing more than slight inconveniences to the Deadite forces, as you may be able to wound one or two of them, they could still get up, even as headless corpses, and chop you to pieces. Dolls coming to life to rip your jugular, or you living anywhere with a tree 
tree standing tall nearby will have this fauna showing its roots to strangle and indoctrinate you. Any physical thing near you could come to life and either drive you insane or kill you. Now, some may believe that the bonds that they have with people could easily break this spell and revert their loved ones back to becoming normal human beings. But Deadites will wise up and act fast to kill you before you even try to have a Martha moment. Either that or these deadites can and will take control of a body and use their memories to lure others into a false sense of security, leaving you to never know who can be trusted and who may potentially be possessed. Any regular deadite can easily kill you with just their strength, abilities, and just the claws that are on their bodies. They can crush your head and just rip you to pieces. Demons coming into our world and using our bodies as their playthings, destroying our brains, ripping the skin off of our body and using it as a suit, and so much more. The mere fact that there is this fog called the Kandarian Demon that flies around as an unstoppable force to possess whoever it wants can be a cause to say why you wouldn't survive. But that's just step one. Even if you're in the midst of a fully militarized response, say you have a bunch of soldiers surrounding you, protecting you, the Kandarian Demon could easily possess just one of these soldiers so that it would turn this soldier's assault rifle on you and the other soldiers nearby to blow you all away. No human is immune to the effects of the evil dead. Every person on our planet is viable for its deadite curse and could turn at any second without any warning. You would have no idea if someone has turned. And if you are killed by these methods, either by a deadite, the demons, or anything by the evil dead themselves, you will be plunged into the mirror dimension where you will frantically, hopelessly try to survive as long as you can. But eventually, you will only be dragged into the darkness, consumed, and have your soul eternally extinguished. And this is all just from the effects of the book, if it is accidentally read from. Anybody could accidentally stumble upon this, decipher it, and all of this could go down. But if the book and its effects are around long enough, the Dark Ones will be able to reach our dimension from their long imprisonment. And from there, there will be no restricting or slowing down their dredge for the Necronomicon Ex Mortis. In the meantime, the brightest minds on our planet could see to deciphering this book and attempt to use the Necronomicon scripture to fight back and use as their own power. But if the knife isn't there, if we don't have anything else to fight back and use as their own power and try to find weaknesses in the army of darkness. But the amount of spells, incantations, and knowledge behind it, behind a language that has been long lost to humanity, would be too much to fully unearth before the Dark Ones claimed the book and cast an eternal darkness upon the planet, summoning Kandar the Destroyer to wipe out anything that our militaries, governments, countries, or humanity itself can muster up. There is nothing at our disposal that can fight back against the Dark Ones, the Deadites, and their armies. Any given person will be infected by the fog of the Kandarian Demon as the Destroyer lays waste to the land. We will be fighting amongst ourselves while this gigantic beast is causing scorched earth. With the Deadites acting as a hive mind, anyone that even remotely gets close to getting a hold of the Necronomicon Ex Mortis or the Kandarian Dagger to repurpose as any kind of weapon that we can mass produce will swiftly be met with relentless retaliation by everything the Evil Dead has to offer. Even if you think you're getting an advantage on fighting them back, maybe an elected official gets indoctrinated, doesn't show that he is a Deadite, and when the time comes when their plans are coming to fruition, that person will turn and kill everyone involved. Everyone you know and love will become a sleeper agent of carnage that wants nothing more than to swallow your soul and leave nothing behind on our world but a wasteland for them to conquer. You and your soul will be exterminated, leaving nothing behind except the body that you had as it is puppeted by a deadite for the rest of time. And in the end, the Dark Ones will reclaim what was once rightfully theirs. That about ends this look into the Evil Dead universe, or this specific universe of the franchise since it's going all over the place in the comics. Did you really think you could survive this onslaught of evil? Really? You sure aren't an Ashley J. Williams. I can tell you that much. You need a lot more testosterone, a lot more badassness, and you need to be...
If you enjoyed today's extensive look at the Evil Dead franchise, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe and voice your thoughts on how we did. Did I get some stuff wrong? Was this too long? You are allowed to have your opinions in the comment section. Remember, it helps in the YouTube algorithm the more comments that are down there. And let me know what you would want in other why you wouldn't survive scenarios. Big thanks to Wisefish for editing together this monster of a video. So be sure to sub to him or else I'm gonna have to whip out the Necronomicon expertise on your ass. And thanks again to Hunt a Killer for sponsoring today's video. Make sure to use my code and link on their website to start your thrilling monthly adventures today. And one more thanks to my channel supporters who have donated to keep the channel going as I move to my new house. We're on the verge of 600,000 subscribers, man. That's hard to believe. And I can't thank each and every one of you on screen and behind the screen enough. Thank you so much. Next up, the simian flu will return us to monkey across the channel. So stay tuned and like always, stay happy, stay healthy, don't read any books, even the ones school gave you, and stay well.